Well, good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to the 14th in the coffee series sponsored by the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership at Seton Hall University. I'm Reggie Lewis, the center's executive director, and it's great to greet you from our campus here in South Orange, New Jersey. The coffee series provides an opportunity to showcase the inspirational stories of servant leaders and the endless ways in which individuals, organizations, and society in general can be transformed by the power of servant leadership, a philosophy in which the leader first seeks to serve. And I assure you that our guests for this session will not disappoint. Our program today is designed to not only deepen our understanding of servant leadership, but to foster an appreciation for ways in which we all can shape lives of hope, healing, and resilience, despite the uneasy times we now find ourselves in. This is why the Greenleaf Center has spent the last 50 plus years promoting the awareness, understanding, and practice of servant leadership. In addition to our webinar series, the Center's signature programs include supporting research to advance servant leadership, online learning opportunities for professionals seeking to apply servant leadership in the workplace. We also expose high school students to the notion of first seeking to serve through our Next Generation Initiative. And last fall, we unveiled an annual lecture that brings together thought leaders and issue experts to address significant societal challenges confronting our nation today. We're grateful for the sponsor of this afternoon's webinar, TD Industries. Thank you, TD Industries. Allow me now to do proper introductions of today's distinguished guests. And I should say upfront, I am very, very biased because these three individuals are very special to the center. They not only bring extensive backgrounds in caring and supporting others as human resource executives, but they also embody stewardship as members of the Greenleaf Center's Board of Trustees. Now a brief word on each of them. Dr. Edwin Garcia is the Chief People Officer at PPC Partners Incorporated, where he is dedicated to making a positive change and promoting the highest standards in the world of human capital management. He specializes in strategy and human resources with over 25 years of experience leading diversity and inclusion, HR, corporate strategy, engineering and research science. I should also say to our audience that one of the first amazing things I learned about Edwin is the fact that he's a trained chemist. He holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of Puerto Rico and has graduate degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, including a PhD in electrochemistry a master's in analytical chemistry and an MBA in general management. He is clearly a man of many unique talents. Catalina Bejanaru is an assistant vice president, HR business partner at AT&T, where she leads a team of HR professionals in support of large enterprise sales segments with international presence. She also provides strategic HR support to senior business leaders there. As an HR business partner, Catalina develops solutions to support business talent management strategy, resulting in growth and productivity gains. Prior to her current set of responsibilities, Catalina was the HR director overseeing the company's HR operations in Canada, the Caribbean, and Latin America. She has undergraduate degrees from Boston University in mathematics and psychology and a minor in French literature. She also holds an MBA in global business from the University of Phoenix. And on top of all of that, Catalina is fluent in French, Romanian, and of course, she is very fluent in servant leadership. Joe Patterncheck is the former chief HR officer at the Cleveland Clinic Health System. Prior to his work at the Cleveland Clinic, Joe held executive HR roles at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and Compact Computer Corporation. He also held a number of vice president positions at Digital Equipment Corporation. Joe holds an MS in human resources management and organizational development 
from American University and a BA in sociology from Northwestern University, where I must say he played football with his twin brother. So Joe knows how to tackle in many ways. In our webinar today, we will hear each of their perspectives on how leaders across industries can support workplaces that foster a more inclusive and engaged environment leading to greater opportunities for individual and communal transformation. Edwin, Catalina, Joe, let's make it official. Welcome to the coffee series and in Joe's case, welcome back. Uh, and I hope you all have got your mugs on your end. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, let's get right into our questions and we'll, we'll lead off with uh, our distinguished Joe out of Boston. Today's workers are increasingly finding themselves laboring in complex and challenging environments. So what are current best practices for creating higher levels of empowerment and autonomy? In other words, how do we help folk to want to come to work and stay at work, Joe? So Joe, you, you're still muted. Gotcha. Sorry about, sorry about that. No Thank problem. You. Thank you. That's a very complex question uh, for obviously a very complex environment that we live and work in today. Uh, and uh, it, it's very easy for leaders to get dragged down into that complexity. Uh, and one of the things that, that leaders need to be doing right now, I feel, and, and frankly, with my consulting business, I work with a lot of uh, variety of industries, is that our job as leader is to get people pulled out of that complexity and get them recommitted to the mission. And we'll be surprised at how few companies take that mission statement off the wall. There's always these mission statements hanging on walls, all right? But how often do we take that mission statement off the wall and talk about it? and talk about how each of us has a role in living out that mission every day. Now, uh, I have a belief that people don't follow mission statements, but they will get behind a cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people see them, see them personally connected to a mission, it becomes a cause for them. Think about a cause that you may have in your own personal life, whether it be a community event, a religious event or whatever, it, it, that cause has passion and emotion. And frankly, uh, failure is not an option mm. when it comes to a cause. So one way to get our people out of the complexity uh, and lift it up is to recommit them to the mission. And there's a number of ways we can, that you can do that. You, you can hold meetings around the, around the mission statement, or you can just start every meeting with a mission, discussion of the mission and celebrate people, you catch, catch people in, in the act of doing something really good, <laughs> connected to the mission and, and celebrate those people. Uh, put them in front of their peers and say, you know, you know, you know, so-and-so did this today. And that was really living out our, the mission today, right? So, you know, it's, it sounds simple uh, and it probably is, but not easy to execute. <laughs> uh, but it takes some, con some conscious effort to get people lifted out of the complexity. I, I frankly, uh, in the companies that I, that, I, that I work for, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, Digital Equipment, the Cleveland Clinic, they were looking to get out of the complexity. <laughs> they wanted to be lifted up and, and feel like there was a higher sense of purpose mm -hmm. for what they were doing every day. So uh, that's, that's just one way. Now, you know, now when people, this idea of, making people want to come to work every day. Uh, we, want more than, we want more than that from people, mm -hmm. just coming to work every day, all right? Mm -hmm. We want people to be engaged. And that means that there, there's some emotional connection mm -hmm. to the organization and to their leaders, and they bring their discretionary effort to the table. They give us that, that discretionary effort. And we all know, we all have discretionary effort. <laughs> uh, whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day or a half a day or whatever, but we want people more more than often, more often than not, bringing that discretionary effort because they're connected to the cause and they're emotionally connected to it. 
So this is just, just you know, one idea how to bring people out of the complexity and get them committed to a passionate cause and mission. Excellent. Uh, connecting folk to the mission, engaging folk, Edwin and or Catalina, would you care to weigh in a bit before we move on to the second question? I'll just say really quickly that, um, you know, just like TD Industries, who I visited with, you know, lifting people out of the day to day to make sure they remain safe in their work site. TD has that, uh, PPC Partners and our sub uh, subsidiaries also has that. And if we can only harness, as HR leaders, harness a little bit of that attention that we give to safety to, to really talk about development, get, getting people engaged and, and their discretionary efforts, uh, that would go a long way to creating those environments where we're not distracted by the day-to-day -day complexity. Excellent. Thoughts, Catalina? That's right, Reggie. I fully, fully agree. Effective leaders drive engagement. That's been proven time and again. Mm -hmm. And that's really um, what these challenging times are about. Uh, offering people a voice, making sure they're heard and listened to, and really staying in touch with the day-to-day -day needs in a way that can inform um, the level of engagement and the level of support that they need. And that's really where um, servant leaders shine, you know? Absolutely. So I think that's that's really, really important. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, as, so as we think about creating these more inclusive working environments, um, getting folk more engaged, excited, um, using their uh, the discretionary energy, if you will, sort of playing with a part of Joe's new terminology there. Um, we also know that it's important to keep in mind uh, accountability. Uh, and so um, Catalina, if you would uh, help us to sort of think about how we might reconcile the necessary levels of accountability with these sort of layers of support um, that lead to higher levels of engagement and empowerment. That's right, Regis. I, I really um, believe that this is where servant leaders shine bringing together empathy and accountability in a way that's productive and effective. And um, so to that, what I'm really grateful for in these challenging times is that a lot of people are giving thought to what empathy is about. Mm -hmm. um, our mental health, um, our well-being in the workplace are all very much the center of the conversation these days. And I'm really, truly grateful for that. Um, and a number of good books and good uh, reference materials are out there that uh, can also help support in this regard. One particular one I refer to these days is um, The Empathy Factor, a book called The Empathy Factor by uh, Marianne Miyashiro. And uh, in this book, uh, she actually points out to one point that I believe is relevant to this conversation, which is has to do with the fact that effective leaders are really better at blending the softer leadership skills, such as trust, empathy, and genuine communication with the tough skills that are needed to keep the organization afloat during these difficult times. So that ability to balance, in my view, is really the... Um, the equation we're trying to solve for here in terms of empathy and accountability and how we bring those together as servant leaders. Um, and with that, what I like to also uh, clarify, and I had to clarify this for myself time and again in the past couple of years, is how do I define empathy and how do I define accountability truly matters um, as a leader. And um, so to that, um, if I look at empathy as really the ability to recognize and understand and share the thoughts and feelings of another um, versus absorbing the workload and expectations of team members uh, due to the hard times they may be going through. So that's definitely a big distinction that uh, I, I definitely have to, had to make. Um, and then also as far as accountability is concerned, um, yes, it is the obligation or willingness to accept responsibility and to account for my actions, but it's not doing this in such an inflexible way mm -hmm. that I'm holding people to original expectations, regardless mm -hmm. of what can come up. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so staying flexible and adapting boldly mm -hmm. uh, in these times is really, really critical. Mm -hmm. And so with that, as a leader, you definitely have to set the tone all the time uh, in terms of using empathy to really connect to the other, uh, to connect with what is really present and real for the individuals you're leading, acknowledging the situations that they're going through. Yes, that's a tough situation. Acknowledge that it is a stressful week or day, um, respect boundaries, and really assess the big picture and uh, take a look at how what an individual or group is going through is impacting the broader team. Um, and this is where the empathy factor, you know, in identifying needs, you can get to the core issues of what might be getting in the way of productivity and lean in to support and remove those, those issues. So to do that, you definitely need to stay in touch with what's real and present. You need to take a daily pulse. Um, what does my organization need right now? What do the people I support need right now? Um, what, what is the vision that I need to communicate? Am I clear about how this vision is, um, is translating to, to the team? Uh, what do they need right now? What does the team need right now to support the priorities and communicating around that constantly? Um, and so really to keep this constant pulse, you definitely need to increase your skip levels, your one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to establish um, an open, open rapport uh, where they can surface what they're struggling with and ask, how can I help? Um, again, there are many, many ways that we've been playing with this for the past couple of years in terms of maintaining productivity in virtual environments, staying in touch with what's real and present with our workforce, um, it's, it's really, really important. Uh, but really publishing those clear metrics, staying in use around the vision, and also understanding uh, where individuals are at really, really helps. So what I find in terms of the three behaviors that are helpful, um, connecting is huge. Really digging deep you know, to engage the teams, asking for help, um, ensure that there's a focus on both customer need and employee need, you know, um, collect and amplify positive messages. Really, we're, we're hearing so many bad news these days yes. that positivity matters. Yes. Um, and then the other thing I learned to compromise on, the second behavior is really valuing precision less ah. and just going for speed. Maybe, ah. you know, more define the priorities clearly, make smart trade-offs. Um, you know, embrace action and uh -huh. really learn from mistakes and, you know, uh, not over-index on punishing mistakes as much in these times, but really seek to learn from them. And then the, the last point I mentioned that's just really been truly helpful, and I mentioned this in terms of adapting boldly, um, you know, what, what needs to come off the table? Uh -huh. What is it that we're not going to do? Mm. Um, yesterday's playbook, throw it away, you know, be willing to take a look, look forward, look at what's ahead, the challenge you're trying to tackle, and, you know, look to strengthen your ability to solve problems together. And that, you know, that last point, um, in terms of working together to solve the problem, lean, lean in, um, you know, don't try to recreate, you know, old, old patterns and, and uh, a playbook that worked in a different time. You have to really lean in with open questions, uh, listen first, you know, suggest second, solve together for possibilities and options. And these are all basics, table stakes for servant leadership that uh, we're all learning um Absolutely. you know every day and learning how to practice so wonderful those are some thoughts thank you thanks for wonderful that. thoughts very insightful particularly as it relates to uh keeping in mind the the value of flexibility uh, adaptability but empathy and if you wouldn't mind catalina loading the chat with that resource uh in yeah. terms of empathy factor that would be great, empathy factor. It's uh, a great and before i uh uh, roll into our third question i want to remind our guests to please begin to think about questions and load up our chat feature because we will have our 
I should say, we'll honor our time for our Q&A segment. Uh, but the next question goes to uh, our friend Edwin. Um, and this connects to the reality that a lot of what's happening in society can obviously manifest itself in the workplace. Uh, this sometimes includes uh, the tension and the divisiveness that seems to pervade uh, or be pervasive across um, our, our communities. Um, so what's the role and responsibility of leaders, uh, regardless of sector, to ensure that such divides are minimized in the workplace? Yeah, so, uh, Reggie, uh, this is the topic of the day, right? <laughs> Everything is happening around us and to us, and, and Greenleaf is very clear, business does not happen independent of society. And he asks business leaders to take leadership roles in society. His own role uh, demonstrates that. And, and if passes prologue, I, I started thinking about this and, and these are turbulent times for all of us living through them. But if we can look back and say, when else did this happen? And in the late 60s, uh, when uh, actually Mr. Greenleaf uh, gave rise to his thinking, uh, there was much similar turmoil, obviously different, but much similar turmoil. And there were uh, people that notably stood up from uh, corporations like uh, Joseph uh, uh, Wilson in the at Xerox in Rochester, New York, having gone to and lived in Rochester, New York while working for, for Kodak, it was something that I came across early while I was there. And, and it's interesting to see the parallels between today and what happened then. And, and uh, not they, they, Xerox doesn't get enough credit for this, but, but uh, under Mr. Wilson's uh, time, and by the way, he did use trustee as servants, oh. that uh, the third essay at the University of Rochester where he was a trustee, there, there's record okay. of him doing that. So he, he asked, how can we empower, empower African-American communities? How can we inject more capital into those communities? And he started this whole uh, diverse supplier diversity uh, effort even before the uh, minority business owned and women owned uh, started in, in government. The other thing that he's uh, very, and Xerox is very credited for having done is creating employee caucus groups to listen to employees. What are they feeling? What is coming into work? How do I how do I embrace the whole employee? Not ask him to leave things at the door, and uh, that's the uh, predecessor for for employee research groups today. So if you think about it, with those two things uh, to combine, uh, he gave birth to a, a multi billion dollar consulting industry around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And and if we think about about that as a way to model today, the biggest mistake we can do as leaders and, and definitely as HR leaders counseling uh, our execs is to try to look the other way when things are right. happening in the environment around us. Know that that finds its way inside. You can't put a firewall big enough to keep that out of the workplace. Wow but actually look at what is the impact for that in your workplace right. and, and tie it to your mission, going back to what uh, Joe was saying, that, that as, as HR leaders, you know, going back to Catalina and her empathy, uh, we, we tend to be very accountable or try to keep people accountable to our commitments. And, and it's easy to do, or at least more prevalent when you look at financials, but do we do that when we think about embracing the whole employee, embracing, you as an individual in the workplace, understanding that that pandemic issues affected, yeah. uh, you know, young parent uh, yeah. parents of young ch children different than the rest of us. Yeah. So, so I think there's an opportunity for us to to look at the past and mm -hmm. actually draw from it some things that we can help counsel our executives today. Absolutely, um, and that's certainly rich history as it pertains to uh, a Xerox. Uh, and I particularly appreciate, Edwin, your point about um, leaders who enable workers to have safe space uh, to essentially not leave their issues or challenges um, outside the door. That's a nice segue into question four, and I'll invite any of our distinguished panelists to address this. And that is, as we consider the layers of challenges confronting many of us today, uh, our continued battle with the pandemic, high levels of economic anxiety, and particularly of late extreme variations in climate, uh, how might we use these struggles to create unforeseen opportunities in our places of work? Any of us, any of our 
distinguished panelists. I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I will just say, I'll, I will quote a famous uh, leader. His name is Winston Churchill. Okay. And he had a great saying, you know, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> All right. Because there's, with that crisis comes huge opportunities for change. Now, look at the change that we've all gone through with this pandemic and how we've used technology in ways we've never used it before. Okay, right. Uh, I, you know, it's, 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 it's not optimal. I mean, being face to face is, is more engaging, but we have more reach certainly with, with, with technology. Uh, there have been businesses after businesses that have, that have changed their value proposition for the market and, and actually launched on great, great opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, some businesses have failed, but others have certainly exceeded as, as, as well. So I think that uh, if we are looking for the opportunity for a, for the opportunity to change, now's the time. I mean, it is because, uh, as uh, Catalina said, the, the, the playbook, <laughs> all the playbooks have been, been rewritten, okay? Uh, you know, this idea of starting with a plan, you know, there's an old saying, you know, we manage the plan, the plan doesn't manage us, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, we, we wanna be accountable to our plans uh, and because that's a very big misunderstanding about servant leadership, you know, the pe people misunderstand that. Uh, if you're serving people and you're empathetic and you're compassionate, how can you be hold people accountable? Well, no, none of us have ever really, you know, been challenged by lowering the bar. All right? We've been challenged by raising the bar and being yeah, held yeah. accountable. However, that bar needs to be redefined and changed. Uh, and so this is the opportunity for us to, to draw upon our people and say, okay, how can we you use this as an opportunity for change? Mm. How can we change the plan based on the environment that we're working in and do this together? Mm. Uh, don't have a few executives locked in the, in their, in, in the, in the corner office and come out with the plan. Mm. This is an opportunity to really engage people and get, get viewpoints from all over the organization mm. and really sh you know, share those perspectives from as many people as you can and give as many people a voice and the, and the change of the plans, and you, you'll get greater levels of engagement, and of course, that discretionary effort that we talked about. Dis discretionary effort, embracing the crisis together. Um, I'm, I see I'm ready to go out and go tackle. Let's look at that, Jim. Um, <laughs> and Reggie, if I may, I, I just <laughs> wanted to add uh, one more thing, because I, I really... Um, love what, uh, what's been being said here in terms of leaning in as leaders to do the right thing in these times. Um, and uh, one, one thing that I find uh, myself doing is leaning in um, in terms of how do I lead inwardly as well as outwardly as a servant leader. And leading inwardly um, really connects also to my own uh, biases and expanding my own view of how I see the world and improving upon it. Um, I'm learning every day. I'm learning new things every day um, in these very, very trying times. But as we do that, I think as leaders, we definitely need to um, acknowledge where gaps exist and create strategies to address them and really consider um, our own criteria for, uh, for how we lean in Right. and where we choose to, uh, to over-index or not. Mm -hmm. And only we know, it's between us and ourselves, only we know uh, the decisions we choose to make and what is informing those decisions. So um, I really do believe that cultivating belonging oh, yes. um, right now um, really asks of each of us mm -hmm. to increase our ability uh, to truly create an environment where everyone can contribute their best. Absolutely. Everyone, where all the voices are heard, um, and we can only do that by acknowledging uh, where you know where there's uh, there's need for acknowledging gaps, and where we need as leaders to lean in. And you know, one of the um, practices I use, um, and I often you know tell myself this, I, I use the acronym pause, take a pause, mm -hmm. 
Um, and I do this often. Uh, I find myself doing this often these days. Um, you know, I, I can't do enough of it, but paying attention to my own inner dialogue, that's the P, <laughs> and acknowledging my own reaction and, and interpretation, judgments, and and uh, biases that I might have, um, using empathy to understand that there might be other possible reactions and interpretations and judgment. So that's the U. Um, standing for doing the right thing is the S. Uh, search you know, for the most empowering and productive way to deal with the situation and then execute an action plan. So that's sort of like my pause acronym, uh, which I use often. And so every time uh, challenges come, and this is uh, this is truly a time when we are each learning, uh, learning every day. Um, so when I'm faced with a challenging situation or more difficult news, mm -hmm. I take a pause and take a look at how I start with leading internally and leading inwardly before I actually go outwardly. Wonderful. Taking that pause to lean inwardly to better serve others. I love it. Uh, before we go over to Q&A, uh, Edwin, would you like to weigh in? Uh, uh, just very quickly tying both the empathy uh, that uh, Catalina has given us and, and the uh, pandemic lessons learned from Joe. You know, he Joe mentioned that uh, it, who knew that we can be productive working remote, right? And, and that we're learning. The other thing that's come out of all of this, as Catalina said, uh, well-being, uh, giving us as leaders the opportunity to ask, yeah. to, to lean in, to say, hey, how are you feeling? How are you dealing with this? And, and uh, the whole well-being and mental health has come to the forefront. Uh, I hope we don't lose that yeah. because it, it humanizes the work environment and, and we can all use uh, more of that at work as well. Absolutely. Uh, we could continue this structured interview probably for another three hours or so, <laughs> but I did promise our audience that we would uh, provide ample time for the Q&A segment. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, my young colleague, Nick. But before I do that, I want to just thank Edwin, Joe, and Catalina for this first portion. Uh, this is why these are our distinguished members of the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so rich and helpful and timely. Nick? Thank you very much, Reggie. And hello to all of our guests. We'll be moving on to some questions that we've received from our audience. So let's begin. And our first question here is directed towards, um, towards Dr. Garcia, towards Edwin. PPC is known for being a servant-led company, a company that embraces servant leadership throughout its culture. So how do you sustain the value for servant leadership with so many things happening in society? Yeah, uh, I think Joe reminded us of the complexity of our day to day earlier on when we started this whole conversation. And by the way, you, you know, we, as PPC, um, it's an aspiration for all our leaders to be servants. We're not all there. We're not all there every day. And it's something that we continue to work on. Uh, so sustaining it is, is critically important. I thank you for the question. As I think about sustaining a servant leadership, you know, you can give uh, speeches about it, you can do seminars, webinars like this, but the, the best example is when people actually are humans with each other and, and leaders treat each other uh, as they want to be treated. We, we, we live by the golden rule and, uh, and actually have those questions since 1998 in our engagement survey. So, so uh, I, I think that's key really looking at, at how a leader or manager can, can be for their employees and, and participate with them in, in their day-to-day. -day. Because sometimes I can't solve your, your issue, but we can acknowledge it and put it in the parking lot and then, and then uh, continue on with our work. And it's definitely a challenge for us, and I'm sure for many others, sustaining servant leadership. But it starts with that manager and employee uh, interaction. And, and that's what we're all working to, to improve. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Pamela, and uh, this is directed towards Joe. Can you please define what is discretionary effort or discretionary energy? Uh, 
I think one of the best ways to describe that is the idea of it's a choice. It's a choice that someone makes, okay, and in terms of, all right, I've been given something to do. I've got, I've, I've got a job to do. I'm part of the plan, but the environment isn't really all that conducive to me being successful. There are a lot of barriers in place. No one asks me if there's any barriers in place. <laughs> I'm in a role that doesn't necessarily play to my strengths, all right, perhaps, all right. So uh, there's a lot that goes into a, an environment that's not all that conducive to engagement. So uh, as a result of that, I make a choice. I'm only gonna give half an effort today. Uh, I, I know what it takes to give 110% effort on this piece of work, but the environment is such that I only, I only, I only, I can get by with just half, half an effort on this, as opposed to a highly engaged environment that's conducive to people bringing out their best. It's, people people want to bring that 110% effort every day on everything or most everything that they can do. Now, all of us have moments where we're fatigue sets in and we can't necessarily operate that level all the time. But the majority of the time, you, we bring that 110% effort to, the, to, to whatever role that you have in the organization. So it's a choice. Thank you for that explanation. This next question here is open to any of you. This is a question about each of your personal journeys. Can you tell us when you first learned about servant leadership and speak briefly about your journey implementing it. I'll, I'll, if, I, if, I, if I could speak first, I, I first became uh, exposed to servant leadership when I worked in the computer industry, uh, 25 years with digital equipment, compact Hewlett Packard. And they didn't call it servant leadership, but they had the, all the principles of servant leadership. Um, then when I was recruited to join uh, the Cleveland Clinic, it was a very command and control environment uh, as, as most uh, physician run hospitals are. Uh, and I was recruited by the CEO to bring some best practices from the commercial businesses to healthcare. And uh, I looked around the organization, uh, put myself into the environment and discovered uh, being the cultural anthropologist that I am, amateur as I may be, right? Uh, you, you, you observe what people do and you listen to the language that they use because language is loaded with values and beliefs. And the Cleveland Clinic had the professional staff and the non-professional staff. Now, it's pretty hard to get excited about the mission of the hospital if you're a non-professional. <laughs> And so we, we changed the language where everybody became a caregiver and we, 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 we looked at servant leadership as the model going forward uh, and took 43,000 people uh, through the whole patient experience training with servant leadership at its core. Uh, and it literally transformed the organization. Uh, not, not overnight, but over a seven year period, uh, we went from uh, being average to poor in patient experience to being in, at world-class levels. So it can make a big impact on the organization. And again, in my experience uh, in high tech in the computer industry kind of led me to this journey at the Cleveland Clinic and was able to uh, pass that on to, uh, uh, at the time, a very difficult environment. So it wasn't a straight line, believe me, uh, but we were able to, after seven years, make that big change. Catalina, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I I have to say I um, am very fortunate to have worked for an organization where um, the heart and soul of servant leadership is really manifested every day. Um, so I I've learned um, along along the way um, that corporations really um, in the in the Western world have a tremendous opportunity to make an impact on society at large. Um, but also that the day-to-day -day matters um, and the day-to-day -day and how you engage and lead truly matters. And I, I've learned that, I've learned it early in my career. I had a role model all, all around me. 
uh, very fortunate to have lived and worked around the world and have learned for leaders in different cultures and learned um, how to lead across cultures in ways that are respectful, engaging, and um, truly make a difference in communities um, at large. Um, so I, it's very hard to pinpoint one particular um, time or example, but uh, I do have to say that role modeling, uh, true leadership and what servant leadership looks like is so important in, in our day to day, no matter what your role is, if you have a big important position or not, your ability to make an impact in someone's understanding of what true leadership looks like, a leader that leads inwardly and outwardly and balances the two um, in doing the right thing every time and living by principle, I think is, is super important. And uh, that's why I'm so grateful for the work of the center and, and for all of you and um, how we uh, choose to, to role model that every day. So that, that's what I would have to say on this. Yeah, for, for my personal experience, I first got introduced to servant leadership in a religious setting. And uh, later on in life, uh, in corporate America, I, I really didn't think how it would apply within a, a corporate environment. And in fact, if you Google search a servant leadership, you, many of the first items that show up in the search are, are really religious in nature. But uh, really, if you think about going back to, to Greenleaf himself, it finds a perfect place in, in our working environment when you think about um, investing in your employees because you might be just one um, customer service, uh, bad customer service experience away from, from major issues in your company. And uh, so, so if we invest, I care enough about the individual to invest in them, to give them the feedback they need to improve. Um, Mr. Peeper, our, our founder of our company, talks about growing oaks and continuing to uh, invest in people throughout their lifetime so they continue to grow like oaks. So, so bringing that religious uh, learned experience into the corporate environment was a challenge, yet that's how I came to the uh, concept of servant leadership. Well, thank you all. It was great to hear about your journeys. I'd like to thank you for addressing the audience's question and thank you for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague Priscilla for a few announcements from the Greenleaf Center. Thank you, Nick. Well, before I pull up the announcements, I do want to say on behalf of Reggie, Nick, and myself, we want to thank our guests for joining us and providing an insightful conversation on creating healthy and inclusive workplace environments in turbulent times. I know that I'm excited to rewatch this as soon as we upload the recording. And now for some upcoming programming. If anyone is interested in learning more about servant leadership, give our online introductory course a try, Foundations of Servant Leadership. Classes begin next week on August 4th, and we still have spots available for anyone interested. You can visit our website, greenleaf.org, for the registration link or use the QR code on the screen. The Greenleaf Center is proud to sponsor the Greenleaf Scholars Program. The purpose of this program is to identify and support promising early career scholars and professionals who wish to study the impact of servant leadership in a wide range of organizational or social contexts. Applications are open until August 5th and the eligibility and application requirements can be found on our website. Lastly, the Center is pleased to host its first annual Servant Leader Hall of Fame reception. This event will recognize individuals and organizations who have demonstrated a long-standing commitment to placing a primary focus on the well-being of others, resulting in measurable impact on individuals, communities, organizations, and society more broadly. Tickets are now available on our website. And if you have any questions regarding any of the following programs we have shown, you can send us an email at info at as well as follow us on social media at Greenleaf Center to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and programs.